greetings, brethren. It's a privilege to be here with you on the Sabbath. It's a special privilege to uh, follow an ambassador from Trinidad to the podium, and a special privilege to listen to a young lady that I've heard sing before, and she does a wonderful job. I'd like to begin the sermon this afternoon with a humorous little story about a preacher who moved into a small town and he was trying to get oriented. And he saw a little boy on the corner and he said, Sonny, I'm the new preacher moving into town and uh, could you tell me how to get to the post office? The little boy looked at him and said, Preacher, it's just right down the street, turn right at the big intersection, it's a big brick building on your left. And the preacher said, well, thank you, Sonny. He said, you know, if uh, you come to my church next weekend, I'll show you how to get to heaven. The little boy looked at him kind of quizzically, and he said, uh, Pastor, how are you going to show me how to get to heaven, and you didn't even know how to get to the post office? <laughs> <clears throat> you know, if the little boy did go to church that weekend... I don't think the pastor would have told him what I learned about heaven whenever I was growing up. You know, I was in high school, there was a song entitled, What is Love? Some of you may remember, that's a long time ago. But the title of the song was, What is Love? And it asked a question in the song, what is love? And the answer was, five feet of heaven and a ponytail. It was a girl. <laughs> you know, girls are interesting. <clears throat> In fact, it was a, I think it was a Rodgers and Hammerstein song from the movie Gigi that said, thank heaven for what? Little girls. Thank heaven for little girls. You know, little girls are fascinating and delightful little creatures. That they're loving, they're cuddly, they're full of life, they giggle, they cry, their eyes sparkle, and they can do wonderful things. And boys can do wonderful things too, but we're going to talk about girls today. <clears throat> it's more fun for guys to talk about girls. <laughs> <clears throat> But you know, if little girls are loved and they're guided and nurtured, they can blossom into very capable young ladies, as we just saw here for the special music, and they can grow into beautiful women who can glorify God and be an inspiration to everyone that they come in contact with. Now, they can develop along these lines if they're encouraged and if they're guided and if they choose to go in a certain direction. But as we've seen today in, in society today, that many girls and women today are considered an endangered species because of the messages that have permeated our society for the last 30, 40, and 50 years, that they've heard in school, they've heard and read in the media, and they've even heard in churches. They've been told that the old ways and the old way of thinking about women are oppressive, they've limited their freedom, they have, uh, <clears throat> they're really no longer relevant today. In fact, one of the books I was reading recently, the author says there is no script. There's no script that a woman needs to follow to become a, a woman. You just have to follow your own intuition. In other words, whatever seems right to you, go ahead and do it. There's no script you have to follow. The tragedy is the fruits of this approach have not been good. Today's studies show that there are probably more frustrated women and more angry women today than have existed in a long time. In fact, there are women writing books, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, who are the daughters of feminists. And they're writing books saying, we were lied to. 
we weren't told the truth. The fruits of that way have not been what we expected. You know, some time ago, I gave a sermon on the pathway to Christian manhood. And I ended the sermon by saying I was going to give another sermon on Christian womanhood. And it's been a while. In fact, it's been embarrassing. Several people came up and said, you said, you said you were going to give another sermon on women. When? Today. <laughs> Today. <clears throat> now, this is not a subject that is, you know, is unique to me. That Dr. Meredith has written uh, articles uh, for some time on these things. And we have been publishing material on this subject. But I want to address the subject today of the pathway to Christian womanhood. The pathway to Christian womanhood. But before we get into the sermon, I wanted to put it in perspective, put the subject in perspective for just a little bit. You know, we heard in the opening prayer that God has given his people the Sabbath. He's given us the Sabbath to set us apart from the world to be a blessing to us. The Sabbath is a time that gives us time to, to refocus our minds, to kind of step back from the routine and to think about really important things. You know, through the week, we're, we're, we're pushed with schedules. We have to think about this and have to think about that. But God gives us 24 hours, and he said, remember the Sabbath day. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Use it for the purpose for which I've given, given it to you. To draw closer to God, to think about God's perspective, and to think about some really important questions in our lives. Why are we here on earth? Now ask yourself as a woman, why am I here? And ask yourself as a man, because a number of these principles will apply to you too. But why are we here? We have 60, 70, 80 years to live on this earth. But what are we here for? What does God want to see happen in us? What is he doing with us? Why did he call us into the church? What is he preparing us for? What are we going to be doing down the road in the kingdom of God? Why are we admonished in the scriptures, Matthew 17, 11, to recapture true values? Why are we told something like that? Why is the church told in Luke chapter 1 and verse 17 to make ready a people prepared for the Lord? Why do we do these things? How do we do these things? And what does this have to do with the sermon today? Brethren, God has called you opened your mind to understand the plan of God. And he's preparing a people to literally change the world, to change the direction of society, to recapture true values, to restore this precious truth that he's given you and me to understand today. We're going to have the opportunity to point out the pathway to Christian manhood, the pathway to Christian womanhood, the pathway to happiness that is eluding so many people today. So what I'd like to do in the sermon today is talk about this pathway to Christian womanhood. What is the path? What is the script? As one author said, there's no script today. You don't have to pay any attention. You don't, you know, people aren't going to tell you what to do. You just do whatever you want to do. You can follow your own intuition. Well, brethren, girls and women have been told for the last 40 or 50 years, there's no difference between men and women. They're really both the same. These ideas of being masculine and feminine, these are sociological constructs. In other words, <laughs> that's just what people think you ought to be. But there's no biological basis for that. There's no genetic basis for that. This is a lie. There is a biological basis and there is a genetic basis. People have known these things for centuries. It's been only been in the last several decades that all this stuff has been thrown out the window. I remember hearing little 
poems and nursery rhymes or things when I was growing up. You know, little girls are made up of what? Sugar and spice and everything nice. And little boys are made out of what? Snakes and snails and puppy dog tails. <laughs> All these yucky things. <laughs> but those comments reflect the fact that boys and girls are different. Duh. <laughs> Like you have to be a, a, you know, a rocket scientist to figure that out. But our, our brains are put together different. Our bodies are put together different. You know, we think differently. We function differently. You know, when they hitch a man and woman's brain up to uh, little scientific devices, and then they give them both a problem, they can see different parts of the brains light up in women than in men. In other words, they perceive it differently. They solve problems differently. Now, they may come up with the same answer, but the mental processes are different. You know, little girls, a lot of times, and ladies, like to talk out their problems. Men keep their mouth shut, and they try and figure it out in their head. And we're just wired differently. doesn't mean one is better or one is not as good. We're, we're, we're made differently. And we, begin, we function differently. But this was one of the lies that people have been told, that there's no difference between boys and girls, and you can make them whatever you want. It just depends on how you raise them. And yet I was reading through a book entitled The Female Brain. It's written by a woman doctor. And she says there are dozens of differences between boys and girls. Dozens of differences, physiologically, biochemically, that they're not the same. And the idea that they're saying this is the same is, is just simply wrong. A lot of women were told back 30, 40 years ago, if you really want to be happy, you need to ditch your husband, get rid of the kids, put them in daycare. You need to be free to be yourself. The real fulfilling thing for you is get out of this home, this house, which is nothing more than a comfortable prison, and get a career and be different. A generation, several generations have done that and they find out it's not as fulfilling. And ladies that stay home to raise their kids, be a wife and a mother, are made to feel like second class citizens. And this is wrong. And the sad thing is some young ladies raised by feminist mothers are coming to realize I've been lied to. The feminist movement is really a bad joke that history has played on several generations of women. That's not a man writing that. That's a woman. In fact, a number of women. What many people don't realize today is that some of the leaders in the feminist movement came from dysfunctional families. They had mental problems. Some were lesbians. And it was a small group of angry women that fostered a revolution. In fact, Betty Friedan, one of the ladies that wrote one of the early books on the feminine mystique, was a Marxist growing up. And if you read a little bit about Karl Marx, he was talking about the workers of the world need to reunite and throw off the oppression of these bourgeoisie leaders. And she just made a feminine concept out of it. A number of these ladies were projecting their discomfort and their problems on a whole generation of women. And other women today are coming to realize this was wrong. This pointed us in a totally wrong direction. You want to look at just a couple of prophecies in the Bible that God said certain things would happen if we turn away from him. There would be consequences if we reject the fundamental principles that God revealed in the scriptures. Go to Hosea chapter 4, where God is describing a case that he has against the Israelite nations, his chosen people. Hosea chapter 4 <clears throat> 
Beginning in verse 1, Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel, for the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. By swearing, lying, killing, stealing, committing adultery, they break all restraints. In other words, they throw away any guidelines, and they do their own thing. Therefore, the land shall mourn. There will be a lot of problems. But down in verse 6, it says, My people... My chosen people, the ones I gave my laws to and called them out of this world, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. They've lost the handle on the truth because you have rejected knowledge. It's talking about biblical knowledge, revealed knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will reject you from being a priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God. You've forgotten what I told you. You've forgotten what I revealed to you that was designed to set you apart from the rest of the world. I will also forget your children. In other words, they will reap the consequences of what you have told them that was not right. And there are ladies writing books today saying, we were lied to. We weren't told the truth. The fruits that we're experiencing is not what we thought we were going to experience. And they're not happy about it. There was a book written by, I believe the lady's name was Carolyn Gragley. She grew up in the same generation as Betty Frieden. However, she wasn't angry. She was a college graduate, became a lawyer. She said, nobody ever held me back from anything said, my teachers encouraged me. She graduated from the same law school as one of the ladies on the Supreme Court who has been a very strong advocate of abortion and women's rights and so on. She has a very different perspective than this Carolyn Gragley who wrote a very interesting book entitled Domestic Tranquility. Domestic tranquility. In other words, she didn't feel like she was in a prison. She didn't feel frustrated. She actually gave up her career as a lawyer to become a wife and a mother and to work with her husband instead of against her husband. And she said it, she said it was the most fulfilling thing I have ever done. Now, contented wives and mothers and housewives are not what feminists want to hear about. <laughs> because... That will undermine their position that they want everybody else to take. So there's some very interesting material if you want to read a little bit more about some of these subjects. But God says there will be consequences if you reject what I've given to you, if you reject the instructions I've given to you. There's some very interesting prophecies through the book of Hosea in uh, chapter 7 of Hosea. I'll just look at a couple here very quickly. Uh, no, excuse me, chapter 8. Chapter 8 of the book of Hosea. It says, Set the trumpet to your mouth, and he shall be like an eagle against the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant. This is God's people. They have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. They have just thrown it out the window. Down in verse 14. Actually, verse 12. I have written for him the great things of my law, but they were considered a strange thing. Verse 14, for Israel has forgotten his maker. We've forgotten God. We've forgotten what he's revealed in his word. And those consequences are beginning to come back to haunt us today. <coughs> what people don't realize is that there is a spiritual dimension. I was reading a letter that was actually written by a president of a small uh, religious college. And he made a very interesting statement. He said, most of the destructive social problems of our age are philosophical and theological in their roots. Most of the destructive sociological problems of our age are philosophical and theological in their roots. In other words, it's a spiritual problem at the bottom. And that's why we're talking about this on the Sabbath. 
The world does not understand what we read in Revelation 12, 9, where it says that Satan has deceived the whole world. You know, Satan has a plan and a purpose, just like God has a plan and purpose. Satan wants to destroy and disrupt and derail the plan of God of producing sons and daughters. You know, the song that we just sang about becoming the sons of God, the only reason they only use sons is because it, 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 it uh, <clears throat> rhymes with another word a little bit later on. But as we will read a little bit later in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, we can become the sons and daughters of God. We can become the sons and daughters of God. That's a very powerful revelation. <clears throat> the Bible is not uh, uh, <clears throat> patriarchal in the sense that it excludes women. There's a lot of things that the Bible says about women that are extremely positive that are not mentioned by various critics. But Satan has deceived the whole world. These ladies that began writing books 40 or 50 years ago, they, they were out to create a social revolution to change the world. And when you read some of their statements, they're really sobering. They said, God's going to have to go. God is going to have to go and get out of the way because we're going to change everything. And there's a lot more, but these things are very sobering. It begins to give you an idea of what some of these people were like and what their agenda was. And it's not surprising that the fruits have not been good. Something else just to point out very quickly. <clears throat> In Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, Paul was describing the society in which he lived <clears throat> and some of the problems that were extent in that society. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 18, and we'll just look at this quickly. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth, who hold back the truth in unrighteousness. The Bible tells us in Psalm 119, verse 172, that all thy commandments are righteousness. So if you're holding back the truth in unrighteousness, you're promoting other things that are not true. You're not telling people what the real truth is. And it says God's wrath is revealed against people who do that. This is not pleasing to God. <clears throat> Verse 22, it says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. These people that promote these ideas and theories, God says are fools because they don't understand the big picture. They don't understand God's plan and purpose. It says their foolish hearts were darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. It says, therefore, God has given them up to uncleanness, to do things that are just plain wrong, <clears throat> who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. It's been sobering reading the books written by some of these young ladies raised by feminists and said, we've been lied to. We haven't been told the truth. The fruits were not good, and they're not happy about that. <clears throat> But God talks about people who exchange the truth of God for a lie. And that God gave them up to evil, vile passions to do whatever they wanted to do. But link this with 2 Thessalonians. We've talked about this you know, over the last year or two. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it talks about in the King James of falling away. It talks about a great rebellion against God. But notice what this rebellion involves. In verse 8, it says, Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and wonders. This is something that's going to happen in the future. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth. And I think when we look at what's happening in society, <clears throat> there's more to this than just theological explanations. You know, the early church fathers rejected the truth about the Sabbath and the holy days and the plan of God. 
But they also picked up a lot of Greek ideas about women. And these were passed on through some of the early church fathers. The Jews picked up some of those ideas. You know, the Jews have a prayer where the men will say, I, I thank God every day I wasn't born a woman. That doesn't come out of the Bible. That doesn't come out of the Bible. That comes from Greek philosophy. You know, Plato and Aristotle viewed women as, as deformed men. This is where some of these ideas come from. So the early church fathers got off track not only in theology. They got off track on some of these other basic fundamental principles about the purpose and the value of women. And for that matter, the purpose and value of men. <clears throat> but here in Thessalonians, it talks about they rejected the truth. Down in verse 11, it says, For this reason God will send to them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Now, Paul was talking about his age. People were believing a lie and getting off into all kinds of weird things. But then this is why God wants us to focus on recapturing true values. Because what we have seen in the last 40 or 50 years, our society has moved way off course. Your young ladies are told that you don't want to be a wife and a mother and a housewife. You're going, to re you're going to waste your life. And if you are inclined to you know, point in that direction, you're going to have to swim upstream. And you're going to have to be courageous enough to stand your ground and say, I'm not going in that direction. I've got a better way to go. So let's look at how it's going to be done. How are we going to teach people God's way of life? How are we going to point them to the path to Christian womanhood? You know, it's not that difficult. It's really pretty plain. It's pretty basic. Mr. Armstrong used to always go back to Genesis, and that's where we're going to go. <clears throat> but we need to have a couple of concepts in our mind before we start reading in Genesis. In Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7, it talks about the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. This is the starting point. If you want to understand the right approach to any particular subject, look into the scriptures and find out what God has revealed. We've got to start there. Because if you don't start there and you start with some theory, you're going to get way off base. In Proverbs 9 and verse 10, it says pretty much the same thing. But it mentions there, knowledge of the holy is understanding. If you want to understand why God made men and why God made women, we need to understand the scriptures. It's, it's that simple. If you get off into sociological theory that changes every once in a while, you're going to get off in a wrong direction, and there will be consequences down the road. You know, Jesus mentioned in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27, you can jot that down, but you're familiar with it. He said, if you build your house on a rock, what's going to happen? It's not going to wash away. It's not going to change tomorrow. It's going to be there. It's going to stay. You've got something firm and solid to build on. But he said, if you build your house on the sand, nice close to the water, and you can walk out there and put your feet in it, what happens when a big wave comes in? It just takes the house away. We've got to build our foundation, what we believe, what we want to become, and what we want to do on the rock of the scriptures. So let's look at Genesis chapter 1 and notice what we can pull out of these scriptures. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. Now keep in mind these Greek ideas that men, excuse me, that women were just uh, deformed men, and that uh, sometimes the Jews pray that... Uh, they thank God that they weren't born a woman. In fact, some of these, one of the early uh, feminists, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, look up a little bit about her. She was very angry that she was born a woman, that she wasn't born a man, and she was mad about that. 
And again, she projected her anger onto other women. But you can't get these concepts out of the scriptures. In verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowls of the air, and so on. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image, and the image of God created him, <clears throat> he created him, male and female, he created them. Ladies, if you are a deformed man, you got God to blame for that. It's just He didn't do a good job. But that is so ridiculous. That is so ridiculous. God does things perfect, and when he... He created men and women and everything else. He said, that's good. That's good. Adam, how do you like this one? <laughs> no, your, your special creations in, 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 in God's plan and purpose. Not inferior, but very special creations. I like the, the phrase, little girls are really delightful creatures. <laughs> they're delightful creatures. Their eyes sparkle and they're so full of life. They can be ornery too, just like little boys. But overall, there's something special. But God made it that way. Then in verse 28, God blessed them, man and woman, male and female, and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Now, two men can't do that. Two women can't do that. <laughs> it takes a man and a woman to do that. See, we can't redefine these things. I think as Betty Friedan asked in her book, The Feminine Mystique, she says, am I wrong trying to change society? Yes. She was dead wrong. But she had an agenda. She was a frustrated housewife. She felt she was being limited. She said, my education at a good school didn't prepare me for washing clothes in a washer and taking care of crying kids. I'm not using my brain. Well, that was her problem. Other ladies find it very rewarding, very challenging. But God said, be fruitful and multiply. Let's look at another scripture, chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 18. It says, the Lord said, it's not good that a man should be alone. Now, let's just stop there, because a lot of ladies are being told today, you need to ditch the husband. You can make it on your own. Having your own apartment and being free is wonderful. Well, a lot of ladies that go down that road, about 25, 35, 40, it's kind of like, you know, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. You know, this is kind of lonely. <laughs> See, the fruits have not been good that way. But God said in the very beginning, it's not good that a man should be alone. It's not good for a woman to be alone. He didn't intend it that way. But sometimes we wind up that way, and we have things that we have to deal with. It's not the end of the world. You know, you can deal with those things. But God said, in, in my plan, in my purpose, it's not good. I will make a helper comparable to him, or a help meet, someone that will complete the man. It's interesting when you read about the male brain and the female brain, that they complement each other. And men and women perceive things differently. And if they can share together, they get a bigger picture, a more complete picture. See, God was creating someone that would be a suitable companion for. And this was after he gave Adam the job of naming all the, uh, the giraffes and the monkeys and everything else and began to realize, hey, there's a male and female monkey and a male and female giraffe and a male and female this and that, but God... There's, there's nobody for me. So there was a lesson he was supposed to learn from that job. You read about that. <clears throat> and then it says in verse 21, verse 20, it says, Adam didn't find a helper comparable to him. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. And he went to sleep and he... God took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh. Then the rib that uh, which the Lord had taken from man, he made a woman and brought her to man. And Adam said, wow, that's cool. <laughs> and in a birthday suit, you'd probably be, be cool. <laughs> Cooler. 
you know, people write this off. Well, this is just stories, you know. This is, this is just, just stories and myths and so on. No, God is revealing fundamental principles here, important foundations. Adam, excuse me, Eve was taken from man, made for man, and they both have the same destiny of becoming part of God's family. They were both created in the image of God. And God, God did a marvelous job on both. And he designed them to complement each other. And finally, in verse 24, 25, it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined unto his partner. Didn't say that, did it? To be joined unto his wife. Again, we're talking about male and female. We're not talking about same-sex attraction which people are told, we've got to be sensitive to that today because that's some people's lifestyle choice, you know. No, it's a perversion of the truth. It's going off in a totally different direction that God says in an abomination. Therefore a man, male, shall leave his father and mother and be joined unto his wife, female, and they shall become one flesh. So these are the concepts that we pick up in Genesis, these are fundamental concepts. This is the rock that we've got to build upon. And in Genesis 2 and 3, you find that man is supposed to be the leader, the guide, the protector, and provider. Now, some people say, yeah, that's the patriarchal approach, and that's what limits women. That's what keeps them down. Again, this is people, things, things that people are reading into the Bible. You know, Adam, or excuse me, uh, <clears throat> No, Abraham was called the father of the faithful. But what was Eve called? The mother of all things. The mother of all things. Some other interesting parallels. You read through the book of Proverbs, and wisdom is personified as what? She. When she builds her house. Women, a woman, is personified as wisdom. It's a very complimentary scripture. The church is described as what? The partner of Christ, the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ. As I mentioned, Second Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 18, where God says, you can become my son's and daughters. You can become my sons and daughters. Pretty powerful scriptures. No put downs at all in those scriptures. But they talk about the role of women to become the daughter of God. He's your father. You can go to him as a father because you're one of his very special creations. He's created you for a purpose. But what are some of the roles of women that we find in the scriptures? And how are Christian women to act? Again, we find the scriptures outlines these things. It's simple. It's not hard. And if you can hang on to these things and build your life around these principles, your life is going to be very different. You're not going to wake up when you're 35 or 40 and say, you know, I've been robbed. I've been robbed. You're going to be fulfilled, not only then, but even later. In Titus chapter 2, Paul is writing to the church and he's giving guidelines. Titus chapter 2, giving guidelines for men, guidelines for women. <clears throat> we're going to skip over the ones for the men today, but we're going to focus on the women. Beginning in verse 3, it says, Older women, likewise, that they be reverent in their behavior. Take a dictionary, look up the word reverent. What does it mean? It means to be devout, to be religious. Devout in your deportment. Now, that's a, a term we don't use today. But I remember when I was in grade school, went to first grade, we got graded on deportment. <laughs> What's that? It's not an export, it's not an import. What is deportment? It's your character. 
We got a grade on it, and I got a U, unsatisfactory. <laughs> and I think I got a spanking. Because <laughs> I must have been doing, I don't remember, but I must have been doing things I shouldn't have been doing. So I got a U for deportment. Unsatisfactory. But that's what reverent means. It's your character. It's your inner beauty. Who are you inside when nobody else is watching? What do you think about? What do you say? How do you conduct yourself? How do you treat other people? God says a Christian woman should be devout. Another phrase from one of the other translations says, suitable for someone in sacred service to God. Suitable for someone in sacred service for God. We heard in the sermonette about a person who was relieved of their job because they didn't conduct themselves properly in a job. It wasn't suitable for someone in an important position. Ladies, you've been called for something even more important, to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ. that we sang about in the hymn. How should you function as an ambassador of Jesus Christ, as a girl, as a young lady, as an older woman? See, we need to have high standards because that's what God is looking for. To be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not gossips. Again, ladies like to talk, they're wired that way. But we've got to be careful what we talk about. We've got to be careful of the words that come out of our mouth. You know, men are kind of blessed in a certain way because they don't talk as much. So you can't dig yourself into a hole too fast. But we still can say the wrong words or give the wrong impressions. Not slanders, not given to much wine. Teachers of good things. Now we can read right over that. But over the last 30 or 40 years, we've had women teaching wrong things that were not good things. And they've deceived a lot of people and hurt a lot of people. We've got to be able to figure out what is good. Figure out the wheat from the chaff and point people in right directions, especially young, young ladies and girls. They've got to be pointed in a right direction. Because if they get pointed in the wrong direction, there are going to be consequences that are going to hurt them and come back to hurt other people. That they admonish young women. Now, here's what older women are to admonish or teach to young women. To love their husbands. And yet these feminists have been saying, ditch your husbands. You need to get free. You need a divorce, get it. You need an abortion, get it. You cut the strings that are limiting you. These are the messages. Admonish the younger women to love their husbands, to be affectionate towards their husbands. And I would say here, girls, be careful who you give your heart to. Don't give it away when you're 16 or 17. You'll get prepared for the responsibilities that you're going to have to handle. And wait till you meet someone that you're ready to marry. Then you begin focusing on, on more of the physical aspects of love. And to love your children. That doesn't mean pack them off to daycare, get them out of your hair. It means to love them. You know, Abraham Lincoln had a foster mother. His first mother died. His father remarried. His second, uh, the second wife Lincoln's foster mother. Notice that Lincoln was a very sharp young man. Didn't have a lot of opportunities, but he was, he was smart. And she encouraged him to read. And she <laughs> encouraged his dad, let him alone when he's reading. <laughs> let him learn, let him grow. And his comment later was, he said, everything... Everything that I am or everything that I ever will be is due to my mother. Is due to my mother. His dad was apparently kind of a ne'er-do-well, wasn't successful in anything, and Lincoln really didn't acknowledge his dad very much. But he acknowledged his stepmother 
because she cared for him. She guided him. She pointed him in a direction that influenced the rest of his life. This is what Paul is talking about. Older women teach the younger women by your words and by your example how to love your husband and how to love your children. And to be discreet means making wise decisions. And this is one of the things that's hard for young people in their teenage years, both boys and girls. They get their hormones going around and they get all excited emotionally. But their brains, the forepart of their brain, the, the frontal lobes, are not fully developed yet. And that's where the sense of judgment comes in. And they're not quite equipped physiologically to handle some of these emotional decisions. But they can be helped if they're given guidelines at home. I was reading an article about some Protestant minister, and he was saying, Parents should not say what's right and wrong about sexual behavior or anything else because that, you know, your kids will hide things from you then. But you know, if you're not given guidelines, this is wrong and this is right. There'll be serious consequences if you go this way. There's going to be a lot easier if you go that way. And studies show that young people that are given those guidelines are not as sexually active. They don't get into as much trouble. But the ones that take this neutral approach, well, I don't know what's right and wrong. You have to figure it out. Then they try and figure it out on their own, and they get into deep trouble. See, these things, these things are so basic. But a Christian woman needs to be discreet. They need to dress discreetly, not displaying yourself over the place, not showing a lot of skin here and there. It's not doing things like that. Well, you might think it's cute. And other girls might think it's cute. But older guys, yeah, that's cute. And they'll take advantage. In one of the churches that I pastored, we had a number of young girls in the YOU. We moved away. And I found out later, two or three of the girls were pregnant, weren't married. They started going to bars. Some guys gave them attention that they were missing maybe at home. They wound up pregnant, having a baby, and no husband. See, these are the consequences. These are the things that happen if people aren't prepared, if they're not discreet, if they don't understand what's proper dress and what's improper dress or comments. And they, you know, young ladies learn that you know, if they wink their eyes at a guy, wow, he kind of does a double take and there's a certain amount of power in that. But if you wink too many times to too many guys, guys that you want to get together with later are not going to have anything to do with you because they realize, oh, she's been around. I don't want her. See, there are consequences to these things. Discreet, chaste. Now, notice how that's spelled. Doesn't mean you've got a bunch of guys chasing after you doesn't mean that at all. It means you know what's right and you know what's wrong, and you don't do what's wrong. And you don't send wrong messages like that. Homemakers. Look that up in some other translations. It means busy at home, good housekeepers, queen of the home. <laughs> Now, this is an art to be able to do that. Guys usually aren't good at making houses, houses into homes. But women have a special knack that way. If it's developed, but it's got to be developed and encouraged. You, know, you can teach your daughters how to keep their rooms clean and how to decorate. And you can teach your sons the same thing. They don't have to be <laughs> looking like they're living out in a barn somewhere. You know, they can keep things neat. That is possible. If somebody's in the military, I think Mr. Davis is sitting back here. He went to a military school. You kept your room clean, didn't you? You bet you did. You polished your shoes, too. Because <laughs> if you didn't, you walked, you walked on guard duty for several hours. And you repeated general orders. It didn't make any sense. 
But it is possible to teach boys to do these things. It's not just a feminine trait necessarily. Good. That means good-natured, kind-hearted, not brash, not crass, not swearing like the guys do, like the guys shouldn't. But this is all, this is basics here. Obedient to their husband. Uh Uh-oh. A lot of problems with that today. That means responsive to your husband, working with him, not against him. And this is why, girls, you need to make wise decisions before you get involved romantically and uh, maritally with a guy. Can you follow him? Can you respect him? Yeah, but he's really handsome. He's a handsome clod. (laughs) Well, then don't go that way. (laughs) You know, what's he like inside, just like what are you like inside? See, there's an external beauty, but there's also an internal beauty, and God tells us what that internal beauty needs to look like. And they're both important. Obedient to their husbands. Don't say yes to a guy that you're not sure that you can respect or follow. Now, you can be a nice person, but he may not be the person that you need to get involved with. Why do these things? The answer there in the last part of verse 5, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. In other words, so people, oh, you're a Christian woman, then how come you're not doing this? Well, you know, that's all done away with. That was just for the first century. We don't have to do that today. God's not going to buy that one, and a lot of other people won't either. So these are some of the guidelines that we find in the Scriptures. Let's go to a couple of others quickly. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, we're pulling out principles. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9. Start in verse 8. It says, I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So that's advice to the men. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair, golden pearls, and costly clothing. Some people say, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Some people read these scriptures and they say, well, you shouldn't wear necklaces and you shouldn't wear jewelry and you shouldn't do up your hair and things like that. We should just be plain Janes, look like we all work for the Salvation Army, and you're (laughs) kind of dressed like that. That's not what it's talking about. If you go back to uh, Ezekiel, keep your fingers here. Go back to Ezekiel chapter 16, where Ezekiel is talking about how God viewed ancient Israel how God viewed the, the woman, so to speak, that he, that he married in the Old Testament. And God looks at physical things that are important. He says, verse 9, Then I washed you in water. In other words, I found you, you were kind of a mess. I washed you in water. Yes, thoroughly washed you off, washed off the blood off of you, and anointed you with oil, probably a fragrant oil. I clothed you in embroidered cloth, and gave you sandals of badger skin, probably pretty soft and expensive. And I clothed you with fine linen, covered you with silk. I adorned you with ornaments, put bracelets on your wrists, and a chain around your neck, and put a jewel in your nose, earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. This is how God dressed and adorned Israel as a woman. So you've got to put this together with what Paul is talking about in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9, where he encouraged the women to adorn themselves in modest apparel. In other words, to dress appropriately, discreetly. Not having a 12 or 13-year-old girl look like a streetwalker walking down the street, displaying herself all over the place. And not to come to church decked out like you've got tons of jewelry on and and you've got sparkle in your hair and all this stuff. There's nothing wrong with fixing your hair. It's interesting that men are attracted physically to women. 
So if you don't take care of yourself, the guys will just look right by you probably. You know, don't let yourself get run down. You know, take care of yourself and guys the same way. Take care of yourself. Be well groomed. You know, find out what kind of a hairdo looks good on you. You know, do these things. Find out how to do these things. I went to a, a male style show one time in Jackson, Mississippi. Paul Harvey was actually the uh, master of ceremonies. I went primarily to hear him, but it was sponsored by the men's clothing stores in Jackson, Mississippi, which was the state capital. So they had a number of the clothing stores and they had these men come out and model business suits and various things like that. They were selling their wares. But uh, I think one of the catch lines on the advertisement for that program was, clothes make the men more money. In other words, the right clothes will help you make more money if you dress appropriately. And I, I picked up some interesting tips there. But there's nothing wrong with, with dressing appropriately, dressing sharply. I remember when I was first hired by Ambassador College, I went to see Dr. Hay and I said, Dr. Hay, I've been appointed to the faculty. Is there any kind of clothes or any kind of car that I should buy or whatever? He said, yes. And I said, well, which, which, which ones? He said, ones that you can afford. <laughs> Ones that you can afford. And you can dress sharply without spending five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars on a suit or whatever, or a dress or whatever. Uh, there are ways to do it. And if you figure out how to do that, then it helps your family budget. But these are just some of the principles that are there. To dress modestly, sensibly, but there's nothing wrong with dressing sharply. Now, some people say, hey, but we shouldn't wear makeup because, you know, that's evil. Well, makeup is like money. You know, money is the root of all evil. It's the use of these things that um, I think my wife sold makeup whenever she was in high school, and the guidelines that she was given at a major department store was that if you're wearing makeup, nobody should notice that you have it on. In other words, it d doesn't jump off your face, but it enhances very subtly. You might want to check Job chapter 42 and verse 14 gives the names of his daughters. And one of his daughter's names was Karen Hapuk, which means a jar of makeup or a painted jar or whatever, mascara. You know, so we need to have balance on these things. We need to have balance on these things. A couple of other guidelines in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> if we put all the guidelines together, we see a picture that emerges of what a woman should be like, a Christian woman should be like. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 10 through 15, is talking about hair lengths. Start in verse 8. It says, for man is not from the woman, but the woman from the man. That was created from the man, from the man. Nor was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this reason, a woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man independent of the woman or the woman independent of the man. Uh, does not, verse 14, does not even nature itself teach that you that a man that has long hair is a dishonor to him? And yet I've seen guys walking down the street with this big ponytail that hangs down in the middle of their back. Um, <clears throat> God says that's, that's not what he wants us to do. But verse 15, if a woman has long hair, it's a glory to her. Now this is God's perspective. Driving down the road the other day, just yesterday I think it was, down here in 74, and it was, looked like it had been an accident, and there was a police person standing there with a butch haircut, kind of chunky, and I think it was a woman. <laughs> but I, I wasn't sure, and I was going too fast to, <laughs> to examine my eyes more closely. <laughs> but I was just thinking, here this gal is walking up. She's got a pistol on her side, and she probably knows how to use it, but it was just kind of unnatural. She's going to come in and straighten out this problem between two men. 
is, is nonsense. It's like sending female ambassadors to the United States to the Middle East. They don't look at women over there in a very positive way. But see, we're trying to be equal to everybody. But we're making unwise decisions today. But God says long hair for a woman is a glory for her. In other words, to wear it in a feminine manner that distinguishes you from a man. This police person I saw yesterday had this butch haircut. It's about this long. But it was just, it wasn't feminine. It looked like G.I. Jane. <laughs> Let's go finally to uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, where Peter is talking about the difference between an inner beauty and an outer beauty in contrast to what Paul was talking about, the outward appearance that we just read about. In 1 Peter chapter 3, it says, Likewise, wives, be submissive to your husbands. That doesn't mean being a doormat and you just let him walk all over you. It's talking about an attitude, an attitude where you're letting, willing to let your husband lead. And this is why, girls, it's important that you... Take some of these things into consideration before you say yes to a guy. Can you follow him? Can you respect him? Can he lead you wisely, lovingly? Be submissive to your husbands. Now notice that even if some do not obey the word, they're not called, they're not converted at this point in time, that without a word they may be won by the conduct or the conversation of the wife. It's how you respond to him how you react to him. That if he notices, well, yeah, you're in this church, but you know, you act differently. You act really differently than everybody else. You know, you're respectful, you're thoughtful, you're adapting to your husband. It says that hopefully that way, through your example, they may even be called into an understanding of the truth. This is powerful stuff. Not beating them over the head with the Bible. Whenever they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, it doesn't mean you walk around and just tremble. <gasps> oh, he said to do something. I gotta go run and do it. Doesn't mean that at all. You might say, Yes, I'd be glad to do that. Wow. See, it's the, that kind of response. It comes from an inner attitude. Let your adornment be. Uh, let not your adornment be merely outward, arranging of the hair, wearing the gold, and so on. Again, it's not wrong to wear those things in, in moderation. But let it be of the hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit. You know, a lot of girls, as they grow up, they like looking in the mirror. They like what they see, and they want to be beautiful, and so on which is not wrong, but what God says, there's something even more important than that. It's what in your, what's in your heart. It's how you think and how you react, what your perspectives are. The incorruptible beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit. That doesn't mean you can't smile. Doesn't mean you can't talk. Doesn't mean you can't have opinions. It means you know when to speak and how to say things in a diplomatic way that can encourage people as opposed to trying to intimidate people, which is very precious in the sight of God. You want to be one of God's daughters and grow up in a pleasing way to him. He says, these are the things to do. These are the things to do. Down in verse 7, husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding. You need to understand, guys that girls are different. They think differently. They respond differently. Now, growing up as young kids, boys like to make fun of girls and tease them because they maybe cry a little bit more. They do some things differently. You need to understand, guys. They're different. They're different. God made them that way to be different. And ladies, you need to understand, guys are not as talkative as you are. <laughs> Give them a break. They're different. But guys, you need to listen to your wife talk. 
And dad, you need to listen to your, your daughter's talk because they like to talk about things. They like to share what's inside. And those are very precious memories and very precious thoughts. But to dwell with each other with, under, with understanding, uh, giving honor to the weaker vessel. In general, guys are bigger, stronger, but not always. Some gals I've bumped into, I've been sorry I bumped into them. Because <laughs> they're bigger than I was. <laughs> but in general, we're talking. It says you're heirs together to the grace of life. See, your destiny is the same. I don't want to run out of time here. But these are the guidelines that we find in the scriptures. And these, this is the script. You can read uh, Ephesians chapter 5 and Colossians chapter 3. To strive to, to fulfill the needs of each other. It's a good book that I've recommended, uh, His Needs and Her Needs. His Needs and Her Needs. And talks about the needs that women have and the needs that men have. And what makes the relationship between men and women so interesting is when you list the needs and priorities, they're exactly opposite. What's the most important thing to a man is sometimes the least important things to a woman. If we just understand these things, it solves a lot of problems. Let me give you, as we conclude, some assignments. Now, I'm a teacher and I can't get away from this. But read through the book of, of Proverbs for young men and young women, especially for young women. Read through the book of Proverbs and make a list. Write out what God says in the Proverbs about women. He says, a wife can be a crown to her husband, a crown. If I'd stand up here just like myself, you know, Winnale's just a guy. If somebody comes up and puts a crown on my head and says, this is King Winnale, wow. <laughs> Makes a difference. But this is how God describes a wife and a woman. He says, you can be a crown to your husband. Read through and study and then talk about with your parents and with other people, maybe in a singles Bible study, Proverbs 31. Beginning in verse 10 where it talks about a virtuous, a wonderful, a special wife or woman. It says in verse 10 or 11 that she is, her price, her value is far above rubies. You're having some self-worth problems, ladies? <laughs> Read Proverbs 31. It says, your price, your value is far above rubies. The only other thing in the book of Proverbs that is equal to the value of rubies is wisdom. That's where God places you. It says, she opens her mouth with wisdom. That doesn't happen automatically. You study the scriptures, you learn how to be wise, how to say things wisely. And she's a very industrious person. Maybe do a little Bible study on the women in the Bible. The women in the Bible. And notice examples. They have examples, you know, Sarah made certain assumptions. Eve was naive because she gave in to temptation. She should have run the other way. But God used <clears throat> Esther as a young woman to save her own people and to preserve the Judah bloodline that Jesus Christ would come from. Very powerful examples. You know, we have published a number of articles. Dr. Meredith had one years ago, it's still on the internet, entitled True Womanhood, A Lost Cause, 1965. You can download it off the internet. I wrote one in 2001 entitled The Feminist Mistake, looking at the history of feminism. Uh, Rod McNair wrote one on the motherhood crisis, May, June, Tomorrow's World, 2008. White Sizelka wrote one, The Cherished Christian Woman, Duty and Destiny, Living Church News, March, April, 2011. Uh, Rod McNair wrote another one, uh, The Modest Attire, Our Christian Responsibility, Living Church News, January, February, 2007. And then we also offer a class with Living University entitled The Christian Woman. 
want to do one more thing before I quit. I want to read you some book titles. We'll put these on the uh, table, maybe out in the other room. We have been writing about this subject for 40 or 50 years. But I want you to just get the gist of what women are writing today about this whole subject of feminism and becoming a Christian woman. Here's one entitled, Feminism, Mystique or Mistake? Mystique or Mistake? Rediscovering God's Liberating Plan for Women. And these are fairly recent books. Another one, Lies Women Believe. Lies That Women Believe, another woman author. Another book happens to be a man. The Miseducation of Women Today. Things that they're taught that are just not right. Another one, what our mothers didn't tell us, why happiness eludes the modern woman. Diane or Danielle Crittenton, very powerful book. Another one entitled, The Flip Side of Feminism, What Conservative Women Know and Men Can't Say. <laughs> because it wouldn't go over very good. This other one, The Female Brain, written by a, a lady MD. And she writes from an evolutionary perspective, so there's a number of dimensions she's missing. But what she does bring out is that the brains of men and women, boys and girls, are wired differently. And that's why they think differently. Another very helpful book by James Dobson, Bringing Up Girls. Bringing Up Girls, things that we need to understand as a parent. Another one, what a daughter needs from her dad. What a daughter needs from her dad, how a man prepares his daughter for life. And one of the consequences today, with the increased amount of uh, sexually transmitted diseases, girls that are raised in fatherless homes tend to get involved with things that they shouldn't at a lot of earlier ages because they don't have the dad there to stabilize them. A couple of other ones quickly. Fashion for intimacy. Reconciling men and women to God's original design. See, there are ladies that are figuring out some of these things and realize there's a different dimension that's not being talked about. Another one entitled, Me, Obey Him. <laughs> Me, Obey Him. It's written by a woman. Again, some very powerful concepts. One I just got the other day, How to Choose a Husband and Make Peace with Marriage. What it really is talking about, how to, how to get a man <laughs> and how to make your marriage work better and is written by a woman. She said, these things work. Final one, and I would encourage you to maybe read something like this. Read it to your daughters and maybe to your sons. The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. The hand that rocks the cradle, mothers, sons, and leadership. And talks about the mothers of uh, some very important people in history. Mothers of George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, John Quincy Adams, Andrew Jackson, Abraham Lincoln, Robert E. Lee, and others. Brethren, God has created you as men and women to fulfill very important aspects of the plan of God. God has a role for each one of you, for men and for women, to play in accomplishing his plan for mankind. He's created men, he's created woman, women, each with a unique role to play. I would encourage you as we conclude the sermon, just realize that there are a lot of dangerous and misguided ideas today floating around in our society that have influenced a lot of men and women and caused a lot of heart, heartache and frustration. What people don't realize today is Satan has deceived the whole world, and he's out to derail the plan of God. There is a script. God reveals in his word a plan and purpose, and he does that because he wants us to experience the benefits of doing things God's way. He wants us to benefit from doing things God's way. I would encourage you as girls and ladies to have the wisdom and the courage
to march to a different drum today. To have the wisdom and the courage to march to a different drum. You have been created to become the daughter of God. You have the privilege and the opportunity to develop those qualities to glorify God. Part of our job in the coming kingdom of God is to be going to point people to the pathway to Christian womanhood. And that's going to include finding, following, and experiencing God's way of life so that you can convincingly share that way of life with a world that is disillusioned, with a world that is confused, and a world that doesn't understand the truth that God has opened our minds to understand. We've got a tremendous challenge ahead, and God has given us some very precious truths to understand. So you can be very thankful, those of you that were created women, that God created you that way. And as guys, we're very happy about that. <laughs>